All right, we're live to tape. I hope everybody is well this morning. I hope you're feeling fine uh, and enjoying uh, the autumn, late autumn weather. We're going to cover a very important thinker this week, someone who will be recognizable to many of you as one of the first true progressives. Uh, that, that term really applies to John Stuart Mill. And very soon today, you're going to see why. Um, although what we need to understand with Mill is really a trio of works. So if you want to firstly understand where he's coming from and what he's proposing, and also, I think equally importantly, appreciate his responses to the different kinds of objections that could be raised to what he's proposing in terms of ethics and also social and political philosophy, which are allied to that, then you need to digest actually the substance of three books, not one. So I'm challenging you this week, those of you who are interested in Mill, and uh, I'm sure you'll see if you haven't already that he's extremely relevant to our current times. So we're going to look to begin with at extracts from a book called Utilitarianism. He's one of the foremost proponents uh, of that branch of ethics, which is concerned with the opposite of Kant. You know, Kant thought that uh, consideration of consequences was immoral in some sense, and that one could uh, be assured of doing the right thing uh, strictly by, by applying the categorical imperative, and having the right intention to do so. Uh, Mill's point of view, not surprisingly, but, uh, up to now we've seen a few different versions of, of ethics, and Mill's point of view is, is going to be opposed to that. He's a consequentialist or teleologist, that is to say, he is concerned with outcomes as being the measure of the rightness or wrongness of actions. And, uh, of course, Kant will be horrified, but I think many, many people would endorse Mill on this point. And he's going to argue for it and defend it in this book uh, whose extracts are in your text, and I'll be sharing some of them with you momentarily. So that work is called Utilitarianism. Uh, have any of you heard uh, of utilitarianism before? Does that name mean anything to any of you? It will, in an hour or so, mean much more, but I'm just curious whether utilitarianism means anything to any of you as a, as a name of um, a very important branch of ethics. Does that ring a bell with any of you? Of course, I've misspelled it because I can't type very well this hour in the morning, but utilit Tarianism, let me re-enter it. That's the better spelling. Utilitarianism. And, and uh, does anyone recognize that term? Has it ever crossed your... You've heard of it, okay. Well, good. Um, and do you know anything more? Has anybody else heard of it? Or is this a new word uh, to the majority of you? Uh, and, and Sophia's heard of it, Anastasia's heard of it. Okay, you're not sure what it means. Well, that's, that's our challenge this morning. We're going to unpack it, okay? And look at at least two different meanings. Uh, the original one by Mill's mentor, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, very interesting, important philosopher as well. And then Mill's reformation of utilitarianism, which was meant to correct some of the faults in... Bentham's version. So that, that's the first part of this morning's work. But I must tell you off the top, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this because it's really supremely important, if you're interested in Mill and if you're interested in his defense of utilitarianism, uh, his defense is not compassed strictly by the book with that title, Utilitarianism, although we'll begin by looking certainly at those extracts. But for reasons that will become clear very shortly, uh, in order for Mill to defend his theory across the spectrum of society to which it's intended to apply, uh, Mill has to write two more books. Of course, this, this was something he loved to do. He, he was a child prodigy with language, very precocious. I believe that his parents had taught him Latin and Greek by the age of three, in addition to English. So he had a facility with tongues and also a facility with thinking. He was probably a genius. Um, but he also walked the walk. Not only in his adult life did he write very important books, uh, which we'll be looking this week, but uh, he also uh, ran for parliament 
and was elected. I think he served two terms, and so he was able also to work politically and very actively to implement some of the changes that he was proposing, changes to things like criminal justice, uh, child labor laws, so social reform that was very badly needed in that sector. Also, he was a proponent, as we'll see, of women's suffrage, uh, meaning he advocated and called for the full emancipation of women in 1869, which was still about 50 years in advance of women getting the vote in the UK. But Mill was, was a proponent of this, and uh, his works uh, are, are well known for that. Uh, also, he's one of the most ardent defenders of individual liberty and individual rights in the English language. So if you care about your own rights um, as a person, then you will want to care about Mill because he's providing a very eloquent and famous defense of them in an essay called On Liberty. But that's also serving the purpose of answering one of the most damning charges that can be levied against utilitarianism, as we'll shortly see, uh, namely the idea that utilitarianism does not guarantee, uh, while it does uphold democratic principles, it doesn't guarantee individual rights on its own. So it needs something else. Uh, and this is what Mill supplies. All right, so I'm already telling you enough hopefully to uh, garner your interest in, his, in, in this thinker and also in what he's going to propose. So, therefore, we'll look first at utilitarianism to understand the theory, and then we will look on Thursday in my breakout group at two other sets of extracts, which are in your Google Drive folders, and those extracts pertain to the fuller implementation of utilitarian ethics as Mill sees it to be necessary. First, in terms of defending individual rights, although utilitarianism is about the greatest happiness for the greatest number, and that's the bumper sticker if you want one. Uh, but to the problem, or one problem, with uh, with upholding or, or, or seeking, striving for the greatest happiness for the greatest number doesn't always or at all speak about what's happening to the smallest number so in that original formulation of utilitarianism, we'll immediately see that you could satisfy a majority and therefore satisfy the utilitarian equation, but it never really talks about what's happening to a minority of people within that society who might well be made very unhappy. Um, so Mill, Mill, of course, is not content to simply allow majority rule at the expense of a minority, or for that matter, to allow a minority to rule at the expense of a majority. Uh, so, so what he needs to do is to defend individual rights so that the utilitarian formula, which is, I repeat, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, uh, is not going to be used to justify, uh, at the same time, uh, bringing the greatest unhappiness to the smallest number. Mill would not have tolerated that. And so his essay on liberty is meant to defend anyone individually from being harmed by another person or a majority of people just in case that individual dissents from the majority view. Uh, that would be no excuse to persecute or to cancel anyone who's not harming anybody else just because they have a different opinion. Okay? So Mill is an ardent defender of, of the what we would call the First Amendment in the U.S. and, um, and also of free speech in, in general, which is under dire threat these days. So that's one point. And the other point, so I'm, I'm telling you what's coming up. Um, the, the, so his essay on, on liberty is therefore an important adjunct to uh, the, the main work on utilitarianism because it, it defends that that. Uh, a thesis against the charge of a lack of individual rights. Mill, Mill, Mill wants there to be individual rights as well as overall happiness. And the second and, uh, and equally important thing that he does in a book called The Subjection of Women, uh, whose extracts you also have in your folders, is to call for complete and full emancipation of women. Uh, meaning uh, political and social uh, uh, privileges and all other things should be extended to them, including, of course, the vote. So this was scandalous still in Mill's day. Victorian England did not support this. 
um, but, uh, but Mill did and, and was therefore a precursor of the 20th century uh, women's liberation movements, okay? So he, because obviously, I mean, it should have already occurred to some of you, uh, and it certainly <laughs> was clear to Mill back in the 1860s, that if you're going to call for the greatest happiness for the greatest number in society, well, excuse me, women are what, 52%, 54%, you know, more than half the population usually of a given society is, is, are women. So how could you possibly speak about the greatest happiness for the greatest number and not include more than half the population in that equation? That would be some kind of injustice or hypocrisy from Mill's point of view. I'm sure I don't have to argue that with you too strenuously. So uh, Mill was saying, well, we obviously have to include everybody. And therefore, we have to include women, and we want to. And he supported this thesis with a whole book uh, called The Subjection of Women, calling for an end to it uh, and, and their full emancipation. So Mill was a kind of hero for anyone who adopts a progressive stance, anyone who's an advocate of, of the kinds of political and social reforms that are uh, being implemented, that have been, or are being, and still need to be in some respects. Uh, and Mill was a, was a staunch defender of these things. So, I mean, I want to portray him as a kind of hero, not because I'm necessarily completely progressive, not necessarily as much as he was, but I, but I think that what he was proposing was absolutely brilliant and timely, and it's argued so eloquently that it's really very difficult to refute. Uh, one can refute utilitarianism, but Mill's version of it, when bundled with individual rights and uh, women's liberation, is going to be much harder to attack, much easier to defend that as a version of social justice. All right, I've said a mouthful, but I've kind of given you the roadmap. So this morning we're going to look at the main work, utilitarianism, and then on Thursday in my breakout group we'll look at salient extracts from the essay on liberty and also salient extracts from the essay or the book on the subjection of women so that we can get the full scope of Mill's vision, uh, not only of what is good and right, but also of what is needful in terms of social and political justice. Are we clear? Is this so far so good? Please let me know if you're reading me loud and clear, and if this is okay with you. Yes, all right, with a smile, okay. I like it, Susanna. Jesse, yes. Sophia, yes. All right, very well. I will then carry on. Uh, and we will dive straight into the formative text, which is a big fat book. Mill loved language, and he managed to write quite a bit of it. He's, he's written books on all kinds of topics, but we're going to focus again this week on the three that I've mentioned, starting with utilitarianism. Let me also say one more thing to you, that if you read about Mill, or if you read Mill's own introductions to his works, you will see that he was very grateful to and gives a lot of credit to his wife, uh, whose name was, um, her, wh wh why am I not remembering her name this morning, Harriet. Um, I, I mean, it's on the tip of my tongue. It'll come back to me before the end of the lecture. Um, but she uh, was, was a great influence on him and a great philosopher in her own right. And, uh, she, but it, she lived in a time, and you have to understand a little bit about Mill's time, okay? Uh, we're talking about, again, Victorian England, the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, and at that time, women were discouraged from, from writing, certainly not from writing, but from publishing. They were allowed to write letters and, and poems, uh, but they were discouraged from writing novels. So, so you had, you know, George Eliot, very famously, who was a man, uh, publishing her novels under a, a, a man's name so she could get published. Uh, and uh, uh, Harriet Taylor was, was uh, Mill's wife's name. But she was a philosopher and similarly was subject to the proscriptions of the age and the prejudices of the age. So um, she would not have been permitted to publish philosophy. No one would have published her philosophy. So instead, she basically, through dialogue with her husband, was able to speak, if you, if you like, through him, and he credits her because a lot of his arguments were rehearsed with her and, and they had tremendous philosophical discussions within the context of their marriage. And so he was influenced very strongly by her and he owns up to it and acknowledges it and, and moreover was very glad of it. 
So when we're reading John Stuart Mill, we're, we're really reading two philosophers. We're reading, you know, the guy who, who wrote the stuff and whose name is on the cover, but we're also reading um, his wife's philosophy into a lot of what he has to say because they agreed. And particularly when we read The Subjection of Women, for example, I think we'll very clearly hear her point of view as well. Okay, so it's a kind of a tag team. And uh, we're better off for it. You also need to understand one more thing, and maybe some of you do. Uh, but for the sake of culture, uh, I would have to mention a little bit more about this period of the second half of the 19th century and uh, the importance of London as a, a very vibrant philosophical and literary culture still is. Uh, but uh, at the time, it was uh, probably the most important place, along with Paris, uh, in Western civilization in terms of its productivity of ideas and of art. So you had at the same time as John Stuart Mill is writing and participating politically to further his his reforms that he envisioned and defended, you also had Karl Marx writing Das Kapital in the British Library in the heart of London. Uh, you also had Charles Dickens writing novels. Uh, uh, so you, you had this romantic rebellion um, against uh, the mechanization of society and the cruelties that that imposed on the working classes. Marx's solution was, of course, violent revolution. And Marx predicted wrongly that the communist revolution would unfold in the most highly industrialized nations, namely at the time England and Germany, which it didn't. But that was his prediction. And then you had other people like Mill who were proposing reforms within the system. Mill didn't think for a moment that the system had to be reformed or rather revolutionized. It needed to be reformed, but didn't need to be revolutionized. You didn't have to do what the French did in their revolution and start chopping off heads in order to have social and political reform. You could do it legislatively. And that's what Mill proposed. Uh, excuse me for one moment, please. I'm still unable to filter out these robocalls. You know, they, they get a bunch of them, but not all of them. Uh, so anyway, uh, what I'm saying to you is that there were many different kinds of reactions to the mechanization of society and to the excesses and the iniquities of the Industrial Revolution. Of course, it brought tremendous progress and prosperity and, and technological innovations and all kinds of other things. But uh, but there was also a, a, a need for reform, and there were many different ways of proposing that. One had this romantic rebellion uh, against the whole idea of mechanization and a re return to nature that was proposed by various poets. You had novelists uh, like Victor Hugo in Paris and uh, Dickens in London who were exposing um, so, some of the injustices through a very powerful medium of literary fiction. Yeah, we're still reading Dickens. Are any of you still reading Charles Dickens? Just a question, just a matter of interest. Are any of you um, in any language aware of the work of Charles Dickens? Anyone? No? Okay. Well, in, in that case, uh, you maybe ought to be or want to be. He's one of the most important writers of the English language, I would say. Um, and... Uh, if you're not aware of Charles Dickens' work, then it's not because it's not important, because perhaps it's unfashionable. But his novels are full of stories um, about the lives of people who were in this time, you know, impacted by uh, the Industrial Revolution and by uh, various kinds of social injustices, poverty, and uh, and other things. So you you might want to to read uh, some of Dickens novels. They're, they're very beautiful and very revealing. So that was one branch of the reaction against the over-mechanization of society and the despiritualization. You remember Barclay was concerned about that more than 150 years earlier, right? When we looked at the dialogues, we saw Barclay already seeing this on the horizon and by the time we get to the Victorian era, it's full-blown. So you have Dickens, you have Marx. I'm sure you've all heard of him. Uh, I probably don't have to tell you who Karl Marx was, um, because probably majority of your professors are Marxists at this point. Um, but in any case, uh, 
Mar Marx was writing uh, in his own way, uh, obviously, uh, to protest and to seek actually violent revolutionary overthrow of governments and, uh, and a, a totally new kind of economic system that he proposed. Uh, and then you also had Mill, uh, and these are just three of many exemplars, okay? And Mill, again, wanted to reform the system. Mill, Mill thought that, that the best bet was to reform from within and, uh, and not get rid of everything, not throw out, as it were, the baby with the bathwater, right? We want, to, we want to clean up the system, but we don't want to do away with it. That was Mill's point of view. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview, very, very brief sketch. Uh, and by the way, I, I would be totally remiss if I didn't mention that exactly during this time, as if it were not enough to have the likes of Dickens, Marx, and Mill, and many other reformers. I mean, these are three names that stand out historically, but they, they were representative of an entire generation of reformers. It was a period of tremendous foment in the culture. So, uh, I mean, you, you, you had many, many other kinds of influences, and one of them, who, who was not a social and political reformer, but who ended up having a tremendous effect on social and political life, was uh, was none other than does anyone want to guess if I if I mentioned to you let's say uh, that there was a great new theory of of biology being proposed uh, or should I completely give it away a theory of evolution so who who's who's proposing that hmm? at the same time as these guys are writing anybody does does Darwin ring a bell. Good, Sophia said it. Yeah, Charles Darwin at this very same time, 1859. That's right, Jesse. Charles Darwin also was writing uh, his, uh, you know, his Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. So he, he was writing, he was opening this whole Pandora's box of, of what we today call the Neo-Darwinian paradigm in biology and the science of genetics, which he predicted. So on top of the political and social and literary things and economic things that were going on in, in this huge uh, ferment, this cauldron of new ideas, uh, comes Charles Dickens, and that also in its own way scandalized society for different reasons. So it would have been very exciting, I guess, to be in college <laughs> at, in London at that time. If you were a university student in London at this time, you would have a lot of stuff on the curriculum that would be exciting in terms of, you know, discussion and, and, and the furthering of, of various ideas. Okay. So very exciting time. Uh, now let's go to Mill. Is everybody all right with that as a kind of a setup? Okay. In that case, uh, good. All right. And I hope I have you interest. I hope I got you now interested in this uh, another thing that I'm going to announce now, and then I'll email all of you, is the uh, just a quick housekeeping note. Uh, your second essay will be due in two weeks' time, and that's the 15th of November, okay? Because this today and Thursday for, for my breakout group and for the rest of you with your own breakout groups this week, we'll be finishing our coverage of Mill. And with that, uh, we'll also be completing this part of the course, right, on ethics and justice. So uh, the last five weeks, including this one, um, we'll, we'll have covered all the readings and, and their various uh, you know, branches and implications. So uh, I'm going to give you two weeks from today to get your second essay done. And I'll remind you on Blackboard, and I will send you all an email okay, to remind you of that fact. The questions are already there, and uh, you have a good two weeks now to pick and choose. Um, and think carefully about who you want to write about. All right, so let's, without further ado, uh, let me share the screen with you, and uh, let's have a look at John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism. Again, it's a pretty big, fat book, and we're only going to look at a few of the most salient extracts to get you thinking this morning about what Mill is proposing and why. And that's our goal for today. Well, I tried to share the screen, but it looks like it instead it hung up my computer. And 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 there we are. 
Is anybody able to see this? Yeah. You are. I'm I'm very glad you are. It doesn't show me that you're seeing it. Oh, now it does. It it, it really had a big hiccup uh, this morning. So everyone is is seeing now uh, this textbook. Yes, is that is that the case? You're seeing utilitarianism. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. You can read about Mill, and uh, he had an interesting life, but he's really concerned now to further the doctrine of you not the ideology please stop using this word some of you i don't know where you've learned it but everybody's using not everybody but way too many of you are using the word ideology to mean anything under the sun it doesn't uh this is a philosophy not an ideology it's a doctrine if you like uh, not an ideology okay please the ide ideology is purely political or economic but when we're talking about epistemology or ontology or axiology, we're not talking about ideology. We're talking about ethics. That's a branch of axiology. We're talking about ethics. We're talking about teleology, if you like. Teleology being uh, the idea that the rightness or wrongness of an action is dependent or is completely dependent on the outcome. Okay? Uh, it's not an ideology. All right. Um, so what is happiness for Mill? Um, happiness is going to be defined, I think all of you will very easily grasp uh, that Mill is identifying happiness with the presence of pleasure and the absence of pain. All right. So if you're experiencing pleasure uh, and you're not experiencing pain, privation means a dearth or an absence or a lack, right? So if you have an abundance of, uh, if you're experiencing at any moment an abundance of pleasure, and a complete absence of pain, Mill says, you, you would probably be happy. And, uh, you know, inversely, if you were experiencing um, a lot of pain and no pleasure at all, uh, you'd probably be unhappy, right? Uh, fair enough. So what Mill wants then to propose is that a right action is going to be an action that brings about as much happiness as possible to everybody concerned, not just to yourself, but to all concerned. So if you're able to uh, create happiness for yourself and others with your action, then, uh, and minimize uh, pain, you know, create pleasure and minimize pain, then you're doing the right thing, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll go a little more deeply into that. Uh, Mill, of course, tells us what all of you already know, that these questions of what is right what is good, what is right, what is just, have been debated, as he says, from the dawn of philosophy, right? The question of the summum bonum, or greatest good, uh, or, or what he says is really the foundation of morality. It is. The question of w what is good is the foundation of morality, right? And he says this has been accounted the main problem in speculative thought. True. And it's occupied the most gifted intellects. True. And divided them into sects and schools. You've already seen some of that going back to the Greeks and onward, all kinds of different sects and schools, um, carrying on a vigorous warfare against each other. Well, that's figurative, not literal. Philosophers have not resorted to slaughtering each other over differences in their beliefs about what is good. Unlike many religious quarrels and political quarrels, philosophical quarrels do not usually result in bloodshed, but they do result in a kind of war of words and ideas. No question about that. And he remarks that after more than 2,000 years, the same discussions continue. Yeah, because no one's been able universally to solve this problem, right? Everyone has a different theory, and, and a lot of these theories hold a lot of water, and yet we don't get universal accord on ethics. It's interesting. We get universal accord on science, and uh, you know, or get closer to, but we do not get such a thing in the domain of ethics. So he wants to propose his own, quite, quite naturally has his own idea which he inherited, I repeat, from Jeremy Bentham. Uh, but Bentham, uh, Bentham's version is subject to a charge uh, which Mill needs to defend, and in doing so, he will switch Bentham's version of what is called quantitative utilitarianism, in other words, the more pleasure, the better, into a version that Mill propounds, which is qualitative utilitarianism, which means the higher the quality of the pleasure, the better, 
and that's something Bentham did not consider and left him vulnerable, therefore, to accusations of hedonism. All right? So, uh, we will get there. What Mill wants to point out to us is that questions of ultimate ends, as he puts it, are not amenable to direct proof. What does he mean by this? Well, um, the medical art, he, he, he gives an example here, actually two examples, medicine and music. The medical art is proved to be good by its conducing to health, obviously, uh, if you have access to, to good health care or access to adequate health care, then, then you, you, you have a better chance of having your health restored. So medical art is conducive to health. But we don't ever try to prove that health is good. Don't we just assume it? I mean, we're, we, you know, we, we assume that most people would rather be healthy than unhealthy. Is it a fair assumption? Would you rather be healthy or unhealthy? I ask you, you know, directly, would you rather be healthy or unhealthy if you're given a choice between? Well, of course you would, Ashanti. I mean, I think most people who, who most people in their right minds, if I dare say, would rather be healthy than unhealthy. We are all going to get sick of, sooner or later. We all, you know, are afflicted by things and sooner or later we're going to die, too. But in the meantime, I think most people would rather be healthy than unhealthy. So we're not trying to prove that health is good. You get the point? We're trying to prove that what conduces to health is good. In other words, good medical care is good, we say, because it conduces to health. But nobody is being asked to prove that health is good. This is something which which most people would already accept as a given thing. Similarly, the art of music is good, he says, for the reason, among others, that it produces pleasure. Well, of course it does. I mean, I hope. Do any of you enjoy listening to music? Anybody out there? Yes, and I'm not even asking what kind of music you listen to. It's not the main thing. Absolutely, yes, you're all agreed. Okay, so of course you enjoy listening to music, uh, and and indeed uh, that would that would be evidence that music is a good. Yes, music is a good thing, uh, but we don't have to therefore prove somehow that pleasure is good. If music brings us pleasure, we say music is good, but we're also then saying that pleasure is good, but we don't have to prove it because most people are obviously doing what they can to experience pleasure, and, and we're not concerned with having to prove that it's good. But the things that conduce to, to uh, health are deemed to be good without proving health is good, and things which conduce to pleasure are deemed to be good without having to prove that pleasure is good, because these are the things that we're seeking. People would rather be healthy than ill. People would rather experience pleasure than pain, and therefore those things are deemed from the get-go to be good without having to argue for them. Is that clear? Is that clear to you? That's very important, right? Because we can assume it. Yes, it is hard to debate that. So Mill's not going to waste his time trying to debate that because he sees that most rational people will agree with him, uh, as, as clearly you do so far. He's not trying to trick us or lead us into a trap. He's just saying this is obvious on its face. So he's not going to, therefore, be obliged to trying to defend that in depth, but what comes next is uh, a little bit a little bit more uh, difficult, because in chapter two he he will espouse what is called the greatest happiness principle, okay, and he thinks this this should be the foundation of morals, not Plato's pure forms, not Aristotle's virtue ethics, not Hobbes's social contract, not. Hume's moral skepticism, and not Kant's categorical imperative, but rather this. This is a different focus. The greatest happiness principle, and here is his definition. It holds, in other words, it believes, it defends, that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness and wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. Okay? and That's clear. So he's telling us what's right. What's right is anything that promotes happiness and not just yours, but happiness overall, whatever your action is, it will implicate not only you, but others. That's, that's you know, the parenthetical acknowledgement that we're social beings. And so Mill is saying that actions which promote overall happiness will be deemed to be right and will be deemed to be wrong, you know, similarly as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness or pain or unhappiness, okay, or displeasure. So by happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain, 
and by unhappiness, pain, and the privation of pleasure, or the lack of pleasure. So if you do things, in other words, if you, whatever actions you take, and actions are also what you say, not only what you do, but whatever you say and do during the day that causes happiness would, would be deemed, therefore, to be good or right, yeah? And if you go around making people very unhappy, <laughs> then uh, that would de be deemed uh, to be on balance wrong. So that's at least a clear definition. But now it's immediately vulnerable to some accusations, this utilitarian thesis. So there are two main accusations that Mill needs to immediately step up and, and repudiate. Um, and the first one is the accusation that his mentor attracted, Jeremy Bentham, because Bentham's version only talks about the quantity of happiness as being important, and that attracted accusations of hedonism. In other words, the more pleasure you experience, yes, the happier you are, and, uh, and that attracted a lot of accusations because people said if you're only chasing pleasure in life uh, and that's your sole measure, then you're a hedonist. And Mill defends here uh, that, tr that accusation. He, ad he admits such a theory of life excites in many minds, and among them in some of the most estimable, in feeling and purpose, inveterate dislike. In other words, there's some very brilliant people who did not like this utilitarian proposal because, he says, he's now rehearsing their counter-argument, to suppose that life has, as they express it, no higher end than pleasure, no better and nobler object of desire and pursuit, they designate as utterly mean and groveling, as a doctrine worthy only of swine, to whom the followers of Epicurus, an ancient Greek philosopher, were at a very early period contemptuously likened. So if you go around saying that you think that, you know, that what's most important is, is happiness and that actions are right as they tend to promote happiness, and by happiness you mean pleasure. So if you promote pleasure, you're doing the right thing. Uh, Mill says you're definitely going to attract accusations of being a hedonist and of promoting a doctrine that is worthy only of swine and not of human beings. Of course, um, Mill gives the Epicurean response, which is also his partial response, thus attacked, the Epicureans have always answered that it is not they, but their accusers who represent human nature in a degrading light, right? So if you're a clever philosopher like Mill and Epicurus in ancient Greece, you flip the script and you say, wait a second, you're telling me that by seeking happiness via pleasurable avenues and pleasurable pursuits, you're accusing me of being a swine? Aren't you really representing human nature in a degrading light? In a degrading light, aren't you supposing that human beings are, are are not capable of pleasures except those of swine? Right? I mean, so that's Mill's first line of defense. He's saying if you accuse this doctrine of being swinish, then you basically are are holding uh, human nature itself in a very dim light. Right? So you see how he flips the script. Yeah. Obviously, and I hope it's obvious. To, to some of you, at least, <laughs> that we're capable of what Mill would call higher pleasures or nobler pleasures or more sophisticated pleasures than, let's say, swine are capable of. And for that reason, it's not demeaning or degrading uh, for us as, as beings to be seeking happiness via pleasure. Okay, that's, that's point one. And this is his first uh, defense. He goes beyond this, though. That's really a defense more of Bentham's version than of Mill's own version. So if we want to understand what he does to utilitarianism to protect it from this kind of accusation, we'll go to the next page. And so he's saying that there are really two different kinds of pleasures overall. And some kinds of pleasures are more desirable or more valuable than others. So this is the main distinction that Mill introduces to rescue Bentham's utilitarianism from these accusations of hedonism. He's saying that there are quantitative pleasures and qualitative pleasures. And I want you to think about this carefully. If we consider quality of pleasure as well as quantity, we may change our notion of what pleasure is. In other words, suppose you would rather have smaller portions of a delicious meal 
rather than larger portions of a, you know, of a very, of a very, you know, bad meal. Well, I think many people would prefer smaller portions of something good rather than larger portions of something bad. Yeah. So um, that would be one way of understanding this. But at least you could understand that if it, if you came to this, if you were offered a choice of the same portion of, let's say, tasty food or, you know, unhealthy food, um, which may be tasty but very bad for you and you know it is, then if you were wise, Mills insinuating, you would choose the qualitatively more beneficial pleasure over the quantitatively more beneficial one. And so he concludes this section by saying of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who've experienced both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, then that's the more desirable one, okay? That's the more desirable one. And so basically he's saying that that if you experience both kinds of pleasures, you know, the quantitatively interesting and the qualitatively interesting, then probably in the end you would give your uh, nod to what's qualitatively better rather than quantitatively better. But in any case, he says, that if a majority of people who've experienced both incline to one or the other, then that's the one that's more desirable. But the key in Mill is to experience both sides of the street. Okay, If you only know one side of the story, says Mill, and he says it in other contexts, that's not enough. We always have to realize that there are at least two sides to everything. So he wants you to go ahead and experience both kinds of pleasures. And that way, um, you'll be able to be a better judge of which is actually more desirable. And he thinks that, and here's the, here's the great thought experiment he asks you to conduct. If you're trying to debate in your own minds, you know, which pleasures are more desirable, he gives you an opportunity to imagine it. He asserts, and maybe you want to disagree with this, but you think about it. Mill asserts that few human creatures would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. <laughs> okay? No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base even though they should be persuaded that the fool or the dunce or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs. Okay, so let me conduct a thought experiment. I always do this when I'm teaching Mill, and everybody always enjoys it. So let's take Mill's thought experiment, and let me ask you, uh, would any of you, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to judge you on the basis of your answer. I'm just asking whether you agree or not. Would you prefer to be any other lower animal, right? Is there any other animal you would rather be than a human being? If, if some wizard, you know, Garrett could change you into that animal, um, would you prefer to be that animal? And you'd be guaranteed, you know, the fullest allowance of that beast's pleasures. In other words, you'd be allowed to have the best possible life that that animal could have, whatever animal it might be. So would you rather be a human with all of the trials and tribulations, but also the possibility of these qualitative pleasures that we can experience? Or would you rather be changed into some other animal and guaranteed the full allowance of that animal's potential for pleasure? I'm just curious, would any of you opt to be another animal? Brandon would rather be human. Josephine would rather be human. Many of you would rather be human. Uh, some of you would rather be a cat. <laughs> okay, that's that sometimes happens. And people could pick other animals and would rather be other. Remember, a cat doesn't live that long. <laughs> but maybe some of you would prefer to to live a, as a pampered. Some people like want to be a pampered lap dog. You know, cats receive pleasure and sleep ten hours a day. Okay, um, yes, probably they do. Um, but uh, but on the other hand. Uh, they still don't uh, enjoy the things that humans can enjoy if we're allowed to explore our quantitative appetites and our qualitative appetites both, uh, then we, we certainly can experience on balance more pleasure than a cat, presumably, right? Presumably. Okay, so he's asking you to think about it. 
and um, if, uh, if, if most of you would rather be some other animal, then I guess you're going <laughs> to refute Mill. But Mill is supposing in his day, as, as I find when I teach this, that, that there are always going to be some students who think they'd be better off as some other animal. But uh, probably on balance, if you really had to make that choice, you know, it's the red pill or the blue pill. You know, if you, if you decide to be that other animal, you can't change your mind later. So you got to think pretty carefully about it, right? Okay, so Mill, Mill wants to argue, of course, that we're better off being human because of our potential, not necessarily because life is purely as pleasurable every day for us as it is for a cat, uh, but because of a potential for, for really the, the fullest extent of our love and appreciation and experience of all the richness of life that we can indeed uh, experience as human beings that, that, that there's no animal that we know of on earth that's capable of exactly that much uh, some of the more intelligent animals obviously can experience we think pleasures but the human capacity says mill for qualitative pleasure is still greater so on that on that uh, ground mill mill concludes and he this is a very famous quote it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied that that puts it in pretty stark terms okay um and why why is it better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied why why is that the case that mill wants to make why are we better off as a dissatisfied human than a satisfied pig anybody can anybody say why <laughs> Mill, Mill wants to convince us we're better off as even if we're dissatisfied, we're still better off being human. Okay, we're obviously better off being satisfied humans. Mill, Mill has argued you're better to be a satisfied human than a satisfied pig. But we're still I exactly right, Ashanti. Exactly, exactly right. I mean, I think that's what Mill intends here, that you have the opportunity to gain satisfaction. A human being has that opportunity. If a human has that opportunity, which Mill wants us to have, right? This is the big, big agenda for Mill. He wants us to have that opportunity to be satisfied. And therefore, if we could become satisfied, we would acknowledge most of us that we're better off than a satisfied pig. So it's a good thing in a way to be human. And, and because we have the potential to be satisfied. It's not only up to us, it's up to a lot of other arrangements, clearly. Uh, but, but it's better to be a human dissatisfied and strive for human satisfaction, as Mill, Mill is really saying, than to be a pig satisfied and not to know any better. And so similarly, the same, the same line goes through. He says it's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied, right? For the same reason. Uh, and if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, he says, it's because they only know their own side of the question, which clearly they, they do know, but that's all they know. And the other party to, to, to the comparison knows both sides. So th this is okay. I mean, Mill is, is saying you should experiment when you're younger, maybe, you know, and, and, and live and do foolish things or do selfish things, you know, do piggish things. And you'll learn from your experience. Uh, that it's better to be human. And because by satisfying ourselves as humans, in Mill's version of utilitarianism, we're also creating happiness for others too. And that's going to put us all in a much better state of affairs than if we're simply doing what fools do and what pigs do. Okay? Um, so that's an important point, and that is his defense of this qualitative version of utilitarianism, yes, which takes uh, precedence over his mentor's version, uh, Bentham's version, which is merely uh, quantitative. All right, and then he goes on to say, and this is an interesting kind of a corollary, that capacity for the nobler feelings, in other words, for experiencing qualitative pleasures, yes, as humans, what we're able to do to appreciate things, yeah, to have a deep appreciation for things uh, long term. That's, that's not just a pleasurable sensation. What he means by nobler feelings is exactly a kind of thing that you could get from a meaningful friendship, for example, or meaningful relationship, or from other things that take time to unfold, which are generally in the province of human culture. And capacity for those things, says Mill, 
those nobler feelings, is in most natures a very tender plant, easily killed. So when we're young, we, we don't necessarily have that capacity in any kind of a cultivated state. It needs to be cultivated by our upbringing, by what we're exposed to, by our education, by our influences uh, that we're very vulnerable to in society. And so Mill says that capacity can be killed, um, not only by hostile influences, but by mere, by mere want of sustenance. In the majority of young persons, he says, it could speedily die away, and it will speedily die away, if the occupations to which their positions in life has devoted them and the society into which it has thrown them are not favorable to keeping that higher capacity in exercise. So this is really why he's a social justice warrior, because he's saying that a lot of young people in the time that he was alive, he's observing that a lot of young people are basically deprived of the opportunity just because of the situation in which they're born, uh, their circumstances of birth. Uh, particularly, and he's not saying this, but he's implying it, particularly in the working classes, the people who are more disenfranchised, the people who have less opportunity in life, less wealth in life, if they are not given a chance, he says, then those capacities which are human uh, but are not cultivated will die away, and then people will remain very unhappy for maybe all of their lives, and so we need, as a society, yeah, to create opportunity for everybody to experience and to cultivate those nobler feelings. And this is also what Aristotle said, if you remember in a different way, back to the Nicomachean Ethics a mere five weeks ago, but Aristotle was also talking about the importance of education in our youth as being the key to the install, uh, the instilling of good habits, all right, of virtues over vices. So this is a parallel situation. Mill was very concerned uh, about particularly reform of, for example, labor laws. There was child labor going on at that time, and Mill thought it was wrong. Uh, there were a lot of other things in the society which were unjust. They had done away with slavery by then, but there were all kinds of class injustices within within England, uh, which, which Mill worked to remedy. And this is part of that project to give young persons a chance to cultivate the nobler feelings to which, as human beings, we are all heir. Okay? So let me ask in that vein whether any of you have ever experienced anything that we would call an acquired taste because obviously some of the things that Mill is talking about uh, is, um, is the kinds of cultivation that he's speaking of is, is partly educational, partly habitual, right? What we're exposed to as social beings. So acquired tastes. Have any of you, for example... No, Mill is proposing a solution, Jesse. Uh, this is what he's doing in this book and in the two other essays. He's absolutely proposing a solution. The utilitarianism is a solution. The idea that, that we should act to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number is a solution. And at the same time, his defense of individual rights uh, is, a, is a solution to excesses of majority uh, empowerment. So all of this is meant to be a solution. He, he's act, Remember, he served in parliament and he worked to change legislation to actually implement social and political reforms. So he's not just talking the talk. Mill is someone who also walked the walk. So let me ask you, that's an answer to you, Jesse. He, he is definitely, he's not lamenting anything. He's really an activist at the same time as being a philosopher. And you may have noticed so far, I, I think you've noticed uh, in our course, that many of the philosophers whom we've studied thus far were also activists, yes? They weren't just people writing books in solitude. They had one foot in society and were working to bring about various kinds of change. All right. So let me ask you now, in conjunction with this paragraph, have any of you acquired a taste for anything that you didn't have when you were younger? Is there anything you really hated when you were a kid? Let's say, is there any food you really hated and now you like? Mushrooms, okay, sushi, beans, all right? Well, you're, you're naming fairly healthy things on balance, 
uh, and uh, and and you can see, therefore, Mill would say, I'm sure that you can see from your own experience that stuff, you know, kids mostly want to eat candy. You know, it's not that good for them. In fact, it's bad for them. It's, you know, too much sugar, not good. But kids, if left to their own devices, would probably not be eating healthy food. A lot of adults don't either, even though they may have more choices. So all Mill is saying is that from your own examples, it's clear there were things, whether it's mushrooms or sushi or beans, or I'm sure some of you have other things you could name that you didn't like when you were kids or maybe even hated when you were kids. And suddenly, or not suddenly, but gradually, you, you acquired a taste. That's why we call these things acquired tastes, because you weren't born to like these things, but you, over time, developed a taste for them. Okay, and Mill would say that's a qualitative example, all right? That's an example of a nobler feeling, in this case, in the dietary regime. Okay, with respect to foodstuffs, you have acquired tastes over time. And so you've learned, okay, to like something. And that is exactly what he's talking about. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the cultivation of the possibility of acquiring tastes that is important. And um, what about uh, what about other things? Have any of you acquired tastes for 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 other kinds of pursuits aside from what we eat? What about what about literature or music? Ah, I was going to ask that, Brandon. So certain music may also be an acquired taste, right? As we grow in life, we have different musical tastes at different ages, obviously. And uh, there is certain music which which is definitely an acquired taste. Uh, so so there you go. And the same would be true of poetry or literature. Uh, the same would be true of other cultural pursuits, would it not? That as we experience life and as we grow and mature, um, our tastes normally, if we're given an opportunity to explore a range of things and we're given some guidance by, you know, sort of experts or, or, or exemplars, then we can try new things and cultivate taste for them. So this is exactly what Mill is talking about. It's not an immediate process. It's not like flipping a switch. So this business about uh, qualitative pleasure uh, as opposed to quantitative pleasure may take some time for us to cultivate, but we also need the opportunity to do it, okay? So I hope that's uh, sort of fairly clear to you. And that's the main response that Mill wants to make to accusations, remember, against Bentham, uh, that uh, if, we, if we're talking only about happiness as a function of the quantity of pleasure, then that's not very good um, because some people will tell you that they get happy when they drink a lot or they get happy when they, you know, do a lot of, I don't know, cocaine or they do a lot of, you know, some narcotic drug and that makes them happy. So that would be a, a, a way of defending Bentham's perspective on quantitative pleasure. And Mill would say, no, that, that can't be right because if you're going to drink a lot all the time, you're probably going to make other people unhappy. It's not just you. You're not a hedonist. You can't be a hedonist. That doesn't work. We know that doesn't work as a social formula. Um, so if you're considering other people in the equation, whether it's people you live with or whether it's people you're responsible for, if you're an alcoholic, uh, it's not going to work very well. You may say you're happy, but actually you're probably not. And also you're going to make others around you extremely unhappy. And the same will be true with addictions to substances, which in the end are not doing you any good either, even though they may bring you pleasure, right? So that's important. And that's why pleasure alone is not, for Mill, a sufficient measure of happiness, nor is it a sufficient metric for the rightness or wrongness of an action, because we have to consider not the quantity of pleasure in terms of how much dopamine your brain is producing, if we want to put it into a modern neuroscientific you know, paradigm. It, you know, it's not just what your brain is producing in terms of a happiness chemical, but it's the quality of the action insofar as it improves or depresses your lifestyle and also, very importantly, affects the people around you. Because if you're living with an alcoholic or you're living with a drug addict, you're going to be as miserable as they are, and it will be you know, an easy thing. They're not producing overall happiness Okay, that that would be Mill's point in a more modern context. Are we clear about this? The distinction between qualitative versus quantitative pleasures. That's very important. And that, so that's Mill's reformulation of the utilitarian uh, formula. And, and it sort of salvages 
uh, his version from the accusations of hedonism that would be levied and were levied against Epicurus and also against Jeremy Bentham. Okay, that's good if you get this. One more point. I want to skip a little bit further now to an interesting point. And you should be reading all of this, of course, um, on your own, in your hour outside of class. These are only extracts. It's a pretty fat book, but I hope you will take some of it more to heart and read in more depth what Mill is defending. And he talks about the ultimate sanction of the principle of utility and why should we obey it. And I want to come to section four and just make this point uh, with you. You can read about the sanction, meaning the justification for it. Yeah, but uh, there's a very interesting point made in section four that I want to share with you. Uh, we'll get there. Okay, what kind of proof can we, can we uh, you know, expose this to? Or what sort of proof is the principle of utility susceptible? Uh, how, how can we actually, how can we actually demonstrate that it's a, it's, a, it's a formula that we want to adopt, right? He's a philosopher. He needs to justify it further. And, and he does an interesting thing in this part of the text. Um, and he's an empiricist, so I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, he says the following. This is a highlighted passage, right? The only proof capable of being given that an object is visible is what? Is that people see it, right? Obviously, if you're going to claim something is visible, then you have to be able to see it, right? The only proof that a sound is audible is that people hear it, right? This is, I guess, common sense empiricism, but if you're going to claim that something is audible, then people have to be able to hear it, right? And so forth. And so he extends that argument beyond the senses and says that the sole evidence that it's possible, possible to produce anything that is desirable is that people actually desire it, right? It's a, a similar extension of that argument about the senses. And so we not only have all the proof that, that we need, he says, but in fact, all the proof it's possible to require that happiness is a good. Why? Because, remember, back to Aristotle, and Mill is, is, is also borrowing the same idea, although he's not crediting Aristotle, and Aristotle certainly, you know, living in a different time. But Mill is saying, remember, remember Aristotle who claims that happiness is something we value. Why? Because of its inherent value to us, right? Happiness is, is valuable in and of itself. It's not an instrumental thing. It's not that we want happiness so that we can use it for something else. It's that we want happiness because happiness is valuable in an, as an end in itself. And Mill is, is reframing that here. Each person's happiness is a good to that person, right? What, what good is, is your happiness? Well, it's good for you to be happy. You want to be happy, presumably. It's, good, it's a good thing to you to be happy. And also, if, if a majority of people are happy, then we have general happiness. So if more people are happy than unhappy, then we have general happiness, and that's good for society. Yeah? And that's the proof. I mean, the proof is just, just as you, you can only prove something is visible if, <laughs> if it can be seen, and something is audible if it can be heard, you can only prove something is desirable if it's desired. And Mill is saying that most people would rather be happy than unhappy. What do you think? Is he right about that? Would most people rather be happy than unhappy? Well, you take it one, one person at a time, since let's assume you can only really speak for yourselves, right? Each of you is qualified. We, we, we suppose to speak for yourself. So would you rather be happy or unhappy? If that were your choice. What would you rather be, happy or unhappy? Happy? Okay, happy. Happy, of course, you say. Uh, happy, all right. And you're entitled to be unhappy if you want. But, I mean, the majority, Mill is simply saying in, um, in 1867, I think, this book was, was written, um, he's saying that most people would rather be happy. And I think that's true today. And some of you were saying it. So in that case, happiness is proved to be desirable because most people say they desire it. And therefore, if each of you would rather be happy, then it, it makes sense that each of you would rather act in such a way as to what? To increase your happiness and at the same time the happiness of others around you. And that way you're going to satisfy that desire. If you act in such a way as to increase 
the happiness of yourself and those around you, that's exactly the utilitarian formula. The greatest happiness for the greatest number. If everybody behaved this way, we would have a, a better society and a happier society, says Mill. So, I mean, that's his basic argument. It is, Jesse, it's extremely wholesome. That's a very, a very appropriate adjective. Subject to one very damning criticism that we're now going to come to. Okay? So now that I've hopefully presented Mill's case to you, along with some of the main threads of argumentation that support it, and again, you can go into depth if you wish. There are many versions of utilitarianism, and Mill has been discussed you know, for the last 120, 30, 40 years for very good reason, because he's an important philosopher. So you can delve more deeply into this yourselves, and I hope you will, some of you. But now we come to another accusation. And this is what, what he needs to write two more books to answer. Remember, the first accusation um, is one of individual liberty and that utilitarianism doesn't necessarily support that, even though it's democratic. And secondly, of course, half the people or more than half the people in the world are women. And, and at that time, women were not deemed to be socially or politically equal to men. And so they were also disenfranchised. And Mill, if you, if you accept Mill as being an honest man, which he is, then there's no way that he could defend this, what you, Jesse, call wholesome philosophy, and it is, to a certain extent, very wholesome. There's no way you could defend the greatest happiness for the greatest number while excluding half that number, right? Obviously, you can't do that. So that's why he needs to argue for women's liberation, because then you really would have the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But he also needs to do something else, and that's what I want to mention now in a little bit more depth in the remaining time, because we're going to go there Thursday to his essay on liberty, as well as his essay on the subjection of women, which calls for women's rights. So, so let's just make this point. If we accept for the sake of argument that this version of utilitarianism that Mill is propounding is, for the sake of argument, a pretty wholesome philosophy. I, I think that's a nice way to describe it, Jesse. Let me propose a counterexample to you now, which will uh, perhaps expose some of its potentially unwholesome aspects. And here's the first one. Imagine that we're shipwrecked. Um, suppose there, there are 11 of us on a boat, and the boat sinks, and we have a life raft. Good news is we have a life raft. The bad news is that the life raft only holds 10 people, and there's 11 of us in the water. So it means if we put 11 people in the life raft, the raft itself will sink. So we can't do that. So it means only 10 of us can get into the raft. Someone has to remain in the water. And let's compound the problem by imagining that the water is full of sharks and they're hungry. So whoever's in the water is probably going to be lunch for the sharks and the rest of us will be in the lifeboat and we have a chance you know, to be rescued. In the meantime, we're safe. So here's the problem. If you apply Mill's standard, uh, you will say, what is the greatest happiness for the greatest number? Well, the greatest happiness for the greatest number is to put 10 people in the lifeboat. Correct? That's the best we can do in the situation. Correct? Of course it's correct. But then how are we going to decide who, who's going to be in the water? How do we do that? What are we going to do? There's 11 of us in the water. Only 10 of us can get into the boat. So what are we going to say? We're going to say might is right. Would anybody among you be happy and say, let's, uh, yeah, Jesse, that's the problem. It's not Mill's philosophy. It's the formula of utilitarianism. Please be careful. He's going to, he's going to address this problem momentarily. But the problem is that you're right on its face. You can't do anything because you're going to have to put one person in the water in order to save 10 people, and that's utilitarian, all right? So my question to you is operational. How are you going to decide who gets into the boat and who gets into the water? Are you going to adopt, are you going to say what Hobbes would say? Imagine Hobbes, you're in a state of nature now. You're all in the water. It's a war of all against all, right? 10 people are going to save themselves. Probably the 10 strongest people will be the first 10 to get in the boat and they'll all push the weakling into the water, right? That's not fair. That's not just, but that's what would happen in a state of nature where might is right, yeah? Okay, but how else are you going to do this? 
Suppose we have a, a democratic system and you say, okay, let's let's vote on who, on who we're going to vote for, you know, to, to be in the boat. And suppose we all vote for the, so who's the least popular person in the group? We have 11 people in the water. Let's, let's do it on the basis of vote, all right? Let's vote that the most popular people could be in the boat. So we'll do a Facebook thing, you know, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll cancel somebody. You know, the one in the group we like the least will be in the water and the rest of us will be in the boat. That's utilitarian. But again, it's not fair to the one in the water or someone could sacrifice themselves. That's interesting, Naomi. That's a very interesting suggestion. So we would ask for volunteers, wouldn't we? We'd say, would anybody volunteer to be in the water? And, uh, uh, and probably not. In case nobody volunteered, if somebody did volunteer, then that would solve the problem. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't necessarily make the volunteer entirely happy either. Um, certainly not personally happy to be eaten by sharks, but maybe happy to be an altruist and save the others. Or we could do a timeshare, right? We could say, okay, let's take turns. You know, that might be fairer, right? Let's say we all get a, t a chance to be in the boat 10 11ths of the time. And one eleventh of the time, you know, five minutes out of every hour and five minutes, or whatever the math is, uh, you know, if every every uh, everybody takes a turn being in the water, and that might be fair. Um, but it's the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But you still see that in this allegory, there's still somebody who's going to be unhappy. That's my point. You see this, where you could satisfy a majority, who would be happy. But there's always the possibility that when you satisfy a majority, somebody who's, in this case, a minority of one uh, could end up being unhappy, but it would still be utilitarian. Is that clear to you that you see the problem with that? Is that clear? It's important that it be clear. All right. So in other words, a situation could be said to be utilitarian. But you could still end up basically now if you take the allegory and you transpose it into the real world, you could see that a majority might, for example, yeah, everyone's risking death by the shark. That's right, Jesse. But it, now I'm asking you to leave the allegory behind because there's no perfect solution to that problem. OK, um, it's equal, but it's still going to be unfair to somebody just in case they get eaten. Uh, it's bad luck that they were in the water at the time. Uh, but it's not perfect, so you can't have utopia. In that scenario, there's no utopia, okay? You'd need a, a bigger lifeboat. Um, but now transpose that allegory into the real human world, and you understand what, what the potential is for injustice that you could have in a given society, and I'm not naming names or historical examples. Unfortunately, history is full of examples where you could have a majority of people in a given society who are very happy, but part of their happiness would depend on the oppression or the unhappiness of others. Yeah, obviously. I'm sure any of you can think of examples, and we don't even need to be specific. It's obvious that in every period of human history, there have been places and times where a majority of people might say they're happy, but that would be at the expense of, let us say, the, the oppression or injustice visited on a minority. And so that would be utilitarian, but surely not just. Clear? Is that clear? It's very important that this be clear to you. And so the, the conclusion one draws from that, or indeed you, you could have it also in a different way. Uh, the other formulation of the same problem is you could have a minority of people who actually oppress a majority. That's also possible. If a minority has enough power, they could also use that to oppress the majority and make the majority unhappy. Then you end up with things like the French Revolution as an, as an attempt you know, to correct that problem, where you have a relatively small number of aristocrats who are living an incredibly a pleasurable life, both in quantity and quality, where a majority of people don't even have enough food to eat. You remember Marie Antoinette's famous pronouncement when, when some minister told her that people have no bread to eat. She said, let them eat cake. Exactly. That's right. Let them eat cake, meaning these elites are so disconnected from reality that they don't even understand the unhappiness of the people who, whom they're oppressing in order to maintain themselves in such a lavish estate. And I think we could very easily identify elites like that today. OK, I'm not naming names. I'm just saying. So Mill would say that's not any better. All right. That's not any better. 
uh, whether you have a majority oppressing a minority or a minority oppressing a majority, there's still oppression. And so utilitarianism, even if you make a majority happy, never guarantees on its face the individual rights of everybody in society and therefore leaves the door open for injustice. And so it's not a proper theory of justice unless you address that problem. This is absolutely critical. And that's why I'm saying to you, Mill needed two other books in order to flesh this out properly, in order to sell this idea that the greatest happiness principle is the one that we should adopt when we actually make laws and, and, and enact policy. We have to consider the individual rights of people in the society and also rights of women at that time who were absolutely excluded from uh, equal standing. So that's why he wrote his defense of liberty, which we'll look at Thursday, to make sure that when we do anything that causes the greatest happiness for the greatest number, which is desirable, we don't at the same time cause the greatest unhappiness for the smallest number. We must never do that, says Mill. Okay, so on liberty is a hedge against that outcome, and the subjection of women will guarantee that everybody has equal rights in the society, once again, in order to satisfy the formula of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Is that clear? I painted the bigger picture for you so you'll understand you can't take this in isolation because if you do, utilitarianism is always going to be vulnerable to that accusation that it doesn't respect individual rights. But I want you to be very attentive to the fact that Mill very much defended individual rights at the same time as he defended the greatest happiness formula. Is that clear to everybody? Yes? Okay. Josephine says yes. Ashanti says yes. All right. So the usual suspects are rounding themselves up. I'm hoping that everyone, Susanna, yes, okay. I just wanted to be crystal clear. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, a very interesting uh, development in, in ethics and really led to interesting developments in political and social reform. So I think you're beginning to see the role Mill played as a progressive uh, and uh, was, uh, as, as most reformers are, ahead of his time. But a lot of what he envisioned has indeed come to pass. So I think that's uh, very significant. Uh, and the role historically, therefore, that he played is very significant. So I wish you all a very good week. I'll, I'll end it here this morning. I hope I've given you a lot of food for thought, not only about what other animal you might rather be, just in case you had that choice, but about how perhaps to get the most out of being human, which is what Mill wanted for us, to have qualitatively good life. Yes, that's really important. Um, important for us all. That kind of happiness is more stable and more enduring than the fleeting happinesses of the quantitative kind. So please contemplate all that. Uh, I will see my breakout group on Thursday, and those of you in Section M uh, are going to have a due date of November 15th for your second day. I say the vast majority of you who are not in my Section M will have your own arrangements f with your own instructors, right? So I look forward to seeing Section M Thursday. I hope the rest of you will complete your treatment of Mill by looking at On Liberty in your Google Drive folders. You'll see highlights. And looking at the subjection of women in your Google Drive folders, likewise, you have highlights. Okay? So um, enjoy yourselves. Be safe and be well. And uh, have a wonderful day. Okay? Thank you so much. You're very welcome, everybody. You're more than welcome. Nice to see you this morning. I'll stop the share. Wish you a good day and a good week. Okay, be well, everyone. And uh, think about John Stuart Mill. All right. I'll see you next Monday. We're going to begin the third section, the final section of this course, with some fun and games, some paradoxes and puzzles. We'll be shifting gears again. Okay, take care. I'll stop the recording now.